Ladies and gentlemen of the media, members of the public who are following us on our various platforms, thank you very much for paying attention. We've just concluded another cabinet meeting this morning, and as I promised yesterday, I would come before the media again um, yesterday. At San Grande, some members of the media did ask to see me, and I indicated if you hold on long enough, I'll be here today. So I'm here now, and I'm sure that you would have a few questions for me. But I have a couple of things that I would like to raise first for the public benefit. It is indeed a, a very sad time for us, the issue in front of us at this precise moment is trying to get to the bottom of what has happened to some of our younger citizens at the Port of Spain General Hospital. I want to repeat what I said yesterday, that something very wrong appears to have happened there. The outcome is death to these young babies and the consequential pain to the families and to the nation, and we are relying on an independent professional investigation from um, PAHO. I, am, I can report to you now that PAHO has identified three persons who will be their team to Trinidad and Tobago. They expect to mobilize these people and be here in a few days before the end of this month by the end of this month, this is the deadline they're working with. Um, in the meantime, the hospital is doing everything possible to eliminate the threat and the danger posed in the relevant ward. But the investigations into what has happened would be done by examining the records, and procedures, and protocols in the hospital to determine what the causes were and what recommendations and liabilities exist on that matter. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I saw, I, I spoke at a press conference not too long ago indicating that one of the assignments of the government of Trinidad and Tobago which is formed from a political party, as you know, in this era is to ensure that the population is fed accurate information, failing which it is quite um, expected at this time that misinformation, outright lies and malice could be fed to the population under the guise of public information. I don't really enjoy spending my time trying to rectify and to produce rebuttals. But I have to do it. Because if it is not done as part of my duty, the population will be fed misinformation. They would be guided by agendas which are not reasonable, fair, or truthful. And therefore, there's a requirement when misinformation or an intention to feed a narrative for a particular outcome is questionable that the government respond. And it is my intention on every occasion that it comes to my attention that the population is being led astray if there's anything that I can do from my office to rectify that, I will do it. And that is why today I will raise with you the latest attempt to mislead the population of Trinidad and Tobago. And it has to do with this whole question of prime ministerial travel and public expense as it relates to prime ministerial travel. My parliamentary colleagues, with their assistance in the media, have found it fit to feed to the population 
big banner headline, scandalous, as do some scandal attends the operations at the office of the Prime Minister on behalf of the Prime Minister with respect to travel. Ladies and gentlemen of the national community, nothing could be further from the truth. The one thing that we have to agree on is that international travel is expensive. We do have protocols in the government as to who can travel, what state of travel, what level of travel, and the consequential costs. For example, if the Prime Minister or a Minister travels, a Permanent Secretary travels, the level of travel would be first class. If a junior officer travels, it would be economy. Those are established protocols across governments. And of course, as a nation, we have business to attend to outside of Trinidad and Tobago. So provision is made in the national budget to cover the travel of government officials, ministers, public servants, and so on. So there's nothing new here. But when it is made out as though the numbers are scandalous, the facts need to be put to the population so that the population is not misled by outright misrepresentation, deliberate misrepresentation. It was said that over a period of almost four years, 19 trips made by in delegations led by the Prime Minister, that those 19 trips cost $10 million. I want you to remember that. That, that is a fact established. But what the population needs to know is that that is a significant improvement on the reduction in travel costs for Prime Ministerial delegations going abroad. But before I go there, I want you all to cast your mind back to when, as Prime Minister, I was castigated in the Parliament by the very same people who are raising this now for not going to COP meetings, not going to UN gatherings in New York. I could tell you, during the last term before 2020, I went to the UN once in 2019. I, made an, I went to the UN just before COVID. And since then, in this term, I went once. So this figure of 10 million would have been considerably higher if I had gone to these meetings. Commonwealth heads of government meeting, the last one I did not attend. That was in Kigali, in Rwanda. That would have been another serious cost. Dr. Brown represented Trinidad and Tobago. We will recall in the parliament when I did not attend the first Guyana energy conference I was accused of all manner of evil for not having gone to Guyana, as if I chose not to go to Guyana. In fact, it was said that I had no good relations with the government of Guyana and that I was, in, I was supporting the government of um, Granger. All that was said in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, what had happened, I had chosen as Prime Minister to have gone to the Gas Exporting Countries Conference in Qatar because there were issues arising out of the uh, Glasgow meeting where gas exporting countries were coming under attack and proposals were being put forward for banks to stop funding the, expo the expo um, exploitation of hydrocarbons. Trinidad and Tobago chose to go to the gas exporting meeting to put our position there. And of course, you know, I, I spoke to you about that already. And of course, um, other persons went to the Guyana meeting. And since then, I have participated in, I think, two or all the Guyana energy conferences, and they've been very valuable to us. So I am not a prime minister who traveling for travel's sake. I indicated to this country that I am the country's number one salesman, and I led from the front in renegotiating and opening terms of contracts that were extremely important to Trinidad and Tobago. So as a result of that, you would have seen in those 19 meetings, a number of very important delegations led from Trinidad and Tobago, led by the Prime Minister, to specific instances 
of activities abroad. So here it is, 10 million for 19 delegations, and that is scandalous. One delegation in a previous government, 20, 2011, one delegation to Australia cost them, and at that time, prices keep going up, right? I'm talking here about 2011. If that same delegation is traveling today, the cost would be about a third higher because general costs have gone up in that way. But at that time, that, minister, that prime ministerial delegation, one, cost $2.6 million. Bear in mind, the scandalous one that you're dealing with now, raised by these same people, one delegation then was $2.6 million. I could tell you now, without fear of contradiction, throughout my tenure as prime minister, no delegation cost $2 million. None. And then there was another one to India in 2012. One delegation to India, led by the Prime Minister, cost $12 million. I didn't see any banner headline in this country about scandal then. You, a scandal, 19 delegations for $10 million over a four-year period is now scandal. But when one delegation cost $12 million. The scandal that was raised then, you know what it was? It was the minister speaking to the parliament and lying to the parliament that it has cost $8 million. Look at here. That was published Express. The same paper that carries the banner headline about scandal for my 19 delegations at $10 million. Would go back there and you will find in May 7, 2012, a story about a minister of the then government telling the parliament that it cost $8 million. When I was telling the country it was $12 million because they had misrepresented the amount. And that $12 million, right, was spread across the government, not just the prime minister's office. There were other ministries that were spending money in that delegation, and I'll come back to that. You see, one of the things I did when I became prime minister was to reduce the size of government, the cabinet. This cabinet is far smaller. 23 members, the last cabinet had about 10 more. So I operate a much smaller cabinet. That is a significant reduction in cost. 40 odd million dollars a year, right? By reducing the number of members in the cabinet. And of course, if you look at delegations then and delegations now, you will see, if I look at the delegation to India, in 2012, you will see there's a prime minister, and you will see traveling first class, which is the most expensive ticket you can get. You can get, but that is part of the protocol. But then, after the prime minister, you see the, perm the permanent secretary, the officer, the prime minister, also traveling first class. I could tell you without fear of contradiction. The permanent secretary in the office of the prime minister has never traveled with me as part of any delegation because there was never any requirement. Then you see a special advisor to the prime minister, then he's now in the parliament calling scandal on my travel. You'll see a certain Shambhal using special advisor to the prime minister. He's hiding somewhere. Australia, I'm told. Yeah. You'd see a certain captain traveling first class. You will see a certain other member, Padarat, advisor to the prime minister. He's there too. You'll see an advisor on public engagement. You will see a Mrs. Vidwati Newton, not a public officer, traveling on first class with the prime minister. You will see a research assistant to the prime minister then, a personal assistant to the prime minister, and a photographer. None of these categories of people travel with me when I travel leading delegations out of this country. And that is why one delegation here could cost 
2.8 million from the Prime Minister's office, and across the government, $12 million. And of course, if you go to the other one from Australia, you will see the same set of people, off with the Prime Minister, $2.6 million. And I repeat, no delegation led by me has ever cost $2 million. And if I am to repeat the basis on which I made most of the expensive trips, it had to do with holding important meetings with people who do business with Trinidad and Tobago, identifiable people, and we negotiated from identifiable situations with outcomes that are identifiable, arising from a series of meetings that I have had. You would have heard from different ministers, finance and energy, that we have been able to recover approximately $18 billion more than we would have had if we had just let the contract slide as written. And these negotiations are not just, hello, how are you doing? They are tough negotiations from people who don't want to pay to you and you want to ensure that they change their minds. So it usually takes a series of meetings. One particular meeting that I had to lead a delegation to was in Melbourne, in Australia. I visited Australia at the invitation of the Australian government for uh, an official visit. I took the opportunity to meet with the head of BHP, who was just about to sell out their interests to the new company, the one they've, the Woodside. But BHP was sitting on an oil field here in the country, which was not producing any oil, because the investment was not being sanctioned. My visit to Australia resulted in that field, Ruby, being sanctioned, and triggered a $500 million investment in that field. It's now an oil-producing field. That same visit to Australia, we were able to tap into an Australian funding mechanism for military equipment. We were the first country to have tapped into it. Out of it came our two Cape class vessels, CG-41 and CG-42. And of course, we were able to negotiate and introduce the purchase for the purchase of the two new the ferries, the Buku Reef and the APT James, funded from Australian credit arrangements. So those were actual benefits of a delegation led by a prime minister to Australia for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And if I go to my visits to the United States, every single one of those visits was a continuation of me engaged either with Trinidad and Tobago issues or CARICOM issues. You may recall that Trinidad and Tobago was head of CARICOM during the COVID period. Arising out of that, we had some significant business one of it was to deal with this business of the risking of our banks. I see one particular member of parliament speaking disparagingly when they mention the name of Maxine Waters. But let me just say something to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. If there was one honorary parliamentarian representing the Caribbean, meaning Trinidad and Tobago and our colleagues in CARICOM, it was Maxine Waters of California because she chaired the Bank and Finance Committee of the United States Congress. And she was instrumental in ensuring that we were not brutalized by the international, meaning American banking community, who were busy de-risking themselves by removing Caribbean banks from the American banking system. And if you would want to know what that means, go and ask Belize. One asked Belize, 
how they conduct business when their bank has been removed from the international corresponding banking arrangement. It means that you can't send money anywhere and they won't do any, nobody could send money to you in the way you've been accustomed to. And that con doing normal trade of letters of credit and so on, you don't have access to a, the, the banking system to do the credit as is required to conduct that trade. That is what we were facing. Maxine Waters took on the issue on our um, exhortation, going to office, making a case, not in one office, but in many offices in Washington. It resulted in congressional hearings in Washington. I represented CARICOM alongside the Prime Minister of Barbados, speaking for CARICOM to the American Parliamentary Committee, who stood with us. And that issue, while it has not gone away, right, the effect of it has been minimized and has receded. But it still is a threat that we face, so we continue. One of the, one of the other visits had to do with me going to the summit of the Americas. I could tell you the CARICOM participation in that summit took place, as you would have seen it took place, only because Trinidad and Tobago led from the front. The special advisor of the American president, Christopher Dodd, came to Trinidad and Tobago to work with us to ensure that CARICOM did not boycott that meeting. Trinidad and Tobago prevented that from happening. And when we got to Washington, it wasn't to Los Angeles, it wasn't business as usual. It was with CARICOM saying to the United States that the time has come for the United States to work more closely with CARICOM on three special issues. One was national security, the other was finance, and the other was agriculture. Today, arising out of that arrangement, directed by the American president, we have three committees operating, with, chaired by the, the vice president and co-chaired by three CARICOM prime ministers. I am one of those prime ministers. Okay? As a result of that, we've had Maxine Waters come into Barbados, meeting with CARICOM leaders in Barbados. We've had meetings in Washington at Blair House of CARICOM leaders meeting with the American Vice President. I can tell you without contradiction, the arrangement and the relationship between the United States and CARICOM has never been better and more direct than it is today. We have access now to decision makers because one of the things I told you here in this country when I embarked upon this approach of leading our country to renegotiate our own contracts is that I will go not to the office in Port of Spain and give any message to anybody to go anywhere because the nature of these businesses require me going to where the decisions are made by the decision makers. And that is why I have been to The Hague I've been to Houston, I've been to Washington, I've been to, 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 to London, and I've been to Melbourne. That is where the board meetings are held, where the decision makers make the decision, and I don't go through, um, as Prime Minister Trinidad and Tobago, I don't go through and rely only on those we talk to here in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why we have been able, in one of the visits that they're talking here about, is a visit to London to sign with oil companies the restructuring of the LNG business in Trinidad and Tobago. But they talk from both sides of the mouth, you know. When we said we will stay holding on to train one, they ridiculed us in the worst possible way. You in the media carry all, be the echo chamber for all the foolishness about how much money we waste, 400 million we waste on train one, and we said, First, that they lied, it wasn't 400 million, it was 34 million US dollars. And we held on to train one to remain at the table to negotiate the future of trains two and trains three. Because we only had shareholding in train four now with the closure of train one. That was successfully done. And today we have shareholding negotiated after a series of meetings in these capitals with these members who make decisions abroad. We now who have a shareholding in train two, trains three, and train four. Also, 
Look at the price of gas today. Is a dollar and sixty cents? Henry Hub? That is where our contracts were anchored. That is where our earnings were anchored. This government in 2015, knowing a bit more than most of them who opening them out and talking now and writing editorials, we knew that that was disaster for Trinidad and Tobago if we did not get unhinged from that. And we took the decision to hit the road and go to the decision makers and said that Trinidad and Tobago will not accept that position. And we talk about fairness and we talk about who the shareholders are. And you would have heard me saying, not only here in Trinidad and Tobago, but I've said it in every single one of those boardrooms, that you have your shareholders, I have my shareholders too, and my shareholders are the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and we want a better deal. We didn't break a single contract, but we got amendments to the arrangement, where today we are not locked into $1.64 for gas, but we, are, we worked out an arrangement with the people we negotiated with, where the markets that are better, the European market and the Asian market and Henry Hub, we use them as a, as a basket and out of it will come a better return for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm here talking about billions of dollars that wouldn't have come to us. And you come calling my name about scandal, over $10 million in travel to get that done. You see all of you crazy. And for the country's main newspaper to be an echo chamber for foolishness from people whose hallmark is theft and corruption that got them out of office. And you who carry the original story of their profligacy. Big string band going to Bihar because the prime minister is going to her roots in Bihar and have the gall today to be asking what benefit the prime minister's travel has had. Every single time it was opportune, when I come back from one of these trips, I talk to the country from some time from Piaco Airport, telling you where I've been and what I've done and how it benefits you. But in today's world of lies as fashionable, right? they want to tell you anything they want to tell you, hoping that that is the conversation that will, will, will become the moving force in the country. So all of a sudden, Prime Minister's travel of $10 million. If I have to invest $10 million in travel to get $17 billion, I'll do it every day. And you know the people who are talking this? They are the ones who made changes to these very same oil companies' conditions in this country. And the effect of those changes were that Norm Christie could have come to me in my office when I was two, week, two weeks as Prime Minister to come and tell me that the incentive that they got from the UNC is such but there will be no money coming from that company, our main gas producer, until 2024. That didn't make a headline in this country. That didn't make an editorial in this country. Not that you didn't know about it, but you cherry pick what you want to talk about. You cherry pick what editorials you want to write. You cherry pick what headline you want to write to deceive the population. Because how could you? See, 19 trips, every single one. CARICOM heads a government meeting. I want to ask the editor who wrote that article, which of those trips I should not have gone on? Tell me which one. And if you can't tell me which one that was unnecessary and who was on the trip that should not have been there, then you are just part of the problem spreading misinformation and disturbing the country's ethos. Because when I go to the meeting, January 28th, that's one of the meetings that they have a big issue with. January 28th, I went to a meeting this year, and it was a meeting to Washington. I took the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Energy, the Minister of Digital Transformation at the specific request of the United States and that particular minister and a minister from the Office of the Attorney General, Renukar Segram Singh, and I took the Chief of Defense Staff. Because every one of them was required because of the nature of the business we were discussing and the people that we were meeting. I didn't go 
to meet my ancestor nowhere and drink and drunk nowhere. I went to meet on Monday the 29th of January, the meeting between Trinidad and Tobago and the United States. The Trinidad and Tobago delegation was led by the Prime Minister and we met first with the United States Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. You, you think Mr. Blinken coming to meet with us because you have nothing to do? Really? You know how difficult it is to get a meeting with the United States Secretary of State? And of course, after that, we met with the United States Trade Representative, Ambassador Katrin Tai, who is a cabinet member, because as you may know, she is advisor and negotiator for U.S. trade policy. And I'll come back to that in a little while. She is the negotiator for U.S. trade policy, cabinet member. We met with her because we have business with her and the United States. <clears throat> we met with the United States Under Secretary for Defense at the Pentagon, at the Pentagon, and Under Secretary for Defense. We met with the director of the CIA, William Burns, at the headquarters of the CIA in Virginia. That all that on one day. Going from meeting to meeting to meeting. I've been to Washington where I've delivered, been to six, seven meetings. I had to stay sober because they are all important meetings and what I say is important to these people and to the future of Trinidad and Tobago. Tuesday, 30th January, I met with the president and chair of the board of directors of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. And I had my delegation members with me as well. I, on Wednesday, the most important meeting, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries at Capitol Hill and several leading members of the U.S. Congress, including Ranking Member Waters, Ranking Member Gregory Meeks, the Home of Foreign Affairs, and of course, Ranking Member Benny Thompson, on Homeland Security. Also a meeting with presidential officers at the White House, with National Security Advisor Vice President Philip Gordon, and also Vice President Kamala Harris. Those are the kinds of contacts and meetings that we go to. And you may think that we just go in, I think it was, I heard it said by one of my irresponsible parliamentary colleague that we go in Washington and look for anybody in a suit and call them and say there's a meeting. Let me, let me just raise something here with you. And this is for the benefit of the public who you all want to mislead. You know who is the biggest investor on the point? This is a state? Public with most number of plants? You know who that is? Which company that is? Let me just tell you about a briefing I got on the 7th of April from Proman. This is from Point Lisa's where the petrochemical manufacturing is done. Proman owns the producer of ammonia and metal. I think they have 10 or 12 plants in that state. This is what they said to me as Prime Minister on a page took of a brief. Because it's, it's not everything that comes in front of the John public on every day. It's only when issues arise and the, there's difficulty that these things tend to surface. There's something here called USA anti-dumping. You know what anti-dumping is, right? It is where there's a complaint that a producer is getting a favor at one end and that the selling end has a benefit and therefore is in a better position. American people who we're competing against because while we are selling in the American market, we are competing against others there to get that space. And they're always complaining about Point Lisa's being a contributor to anti-dumping 
arrangements that whoever is operating there because the government owns this and the government owns that, they are getting benefit and they should be subject to. How anti-dumping is dealt with is that they set about to balance the market by adding a tariff onto the price that you want to sell for so that your sale price will be more expensive um, and compare more reasonably with other people who didn't get the benefit of point leases. I want to quote a couple of lines from this for you. And it says, not for the first time, Proman has been exposed unfairly to anti-dumping and countervailing duties doing business in the United States. That is a red flag seen and observed by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. It goes on to say, the current direction of travel is leading us to consider closing the plant. One has already been closed, closing the second one. But melamine is now under attack for anti-dumping. And if this comes to pass, it could result in a closure of that plant. I need not tell you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, if this is the outcome, how detrimental that is to our interests. And then the last line in the paragraph is this one. Is there any way to get the United States diplomatic support for trade between Trinidad and Tobago and the United States? Does that mean anything to you? You think that means anything to those who make it an issue of the course of the Prime Minister's travel and the Prime Minister's delegation? We are here talking about the future of companies at Point Lisas against attacks of this nature. And the investor is saying there's a consideration that we may have to lose those plants if we lose this argument. Could we get help from our friends in the United States in this matter? And that is why the government of Trinidad and Tobago has to respond. And leading from the front, I lead as Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago because I don't spend time here talking about who's going to get the next seat and who's going to win the next election. I spend time talking about where the next meal is going to come from for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I don't intend to spend any more of my time responding to Rudal Munilal, who should spend his time responding to the courthouse where he has to put in his order, putting his defense. I see him saying that his defense is from, that is a long time story. It's a no long time story, it's a current matter. He's ordered by the court on the 1st of May to put in a defense for money spent in a state enterprise where he has questions to answer. And if you don't believe me, go and read Justice Abood's judgment. That is a secret in this country. I didn't see any headline in the papers saying scandal about that where a minister's name was called 13 times in a judgment from the court. But the very said minister could talk foolishness about prime ministerial travel. And you could put a big headline, a red banner headline, but scandalous, pretending you don't know what a scandal is. I think the Express knows what a scandal is. And I think the press here knows what scandals are. Because when you were, when you were hung in Marlin up and down, you know what scandal was. But you know a mention of $10 million. I would end this conversation by saying, I don't care if it's $10 million, or it is $1 million, or $1. As long as you and your friends cannot truthfully say that I stole public money, I have nothing to say to you and your friends because you are misleading people. This is the era of social media. This is the era of Cambridge Analytica. This is the era of the UNC telling a lie every single day. Go down to Mon Diablo and ask them if they're getting water. The Minister of Public Utilities went to Mon Diablo and got them water for the first time in 17 years, breaking the back of a scandal there. And what is your position? She got a platform and say, oh, they put down a pipe in Mon Diablo and no water coming through the pipe. That level of telling lies and coming at the other level, trying to make prime ministerial travel. 
as the issue in Trinidad and Tobago today. But let me just say that none of that is facing me. Because the record that I can stand on today is a record of getting benefits for the people of Trinidad and Tobago like no other. And under these current circumstances, between 2015 and now, it has been particularly difficult. I want to remind you all, when I was sworn in on September 9, 2015, oil price started diving just before we got into government. It came down from $100 and it was in the 40s when we came into government and it went down to zero. On one day, the price of oil was zero, the quotation. And then COVID. And then our gas production, our fields are drying up. We're down to 2.6 BCF a day as against 4.1. But there's a conversation of lies to give you the impression that something is going wrong because of us. I saw the opposition leader saying that, oh, the government is putting all these eggs in the, in the Venezuela basket. They try to get us to follow them into a President Guaido presidency in Venezuela. Following the United States and President Guaido, we did not. We stood on our solid principles. As a matter of fact, when there was a threat of an invasion of Venezuela, we went to the United Nations. Trinidad Tobago Prime Minister and the Prime Minister of Barbados, we went to the United Nations Secretary General and objected to what was going on in Venezuela. With the fluxion of time now, you may want to ask the UNC, where is President Guaido? And who has brought about regime change in Venezuela? Who answers the, who answers the phone in Miraflores Palace when I call Venezuela? Who answers it there? And why is it that the opposition leader must be lying to the population saying that we are putting all our eggs in the Venezuelan um, basket and, and dragon? Why not tell the population that we own 27% of the Loran Manatee field? And because we are desperately in need of more gas, this government has been able to disengage from the unitization that took 15 years and produced nothing. And we got Venezuela to agree for us to extract our 27% manatee from the Loran Manatee field. That is underway right now. And why don't you tell the country, as we have done, that we are negotiating with Venezuela right now for similar arrangements where we have um, on border fields, coquina and, 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 and mannequin, where we can extract our portion from those fields, which won't gonna come to us if we go down the road of unitization. And why don't you say, notwithstanding the difficulties caused by American intervention in Venezuela over elections of all things, that we have been able to convince the Americans after these series of meetings to give us an OFAC license a carve out from the whatever penalty they want to put on Venezuela. And arising out of that, we now have in our hand a 30-year license for a field that doesn't belong to us across the border. That is the work of good governance. That is the work of a prime minister leading from in front. And that is what I'm proud about. And if the courts of Trinidad and Tobago were functioning as they should function, Many of them wouldn't be in the parliament now. We have a, they want to know everything. They want accountability. They want responsibility. But you come to the parliament where there's a parliamentary committee examining the expenditure in the largest project ever entered into by the government of Trinidad and Tobago, the OS project to build the highway to point 14. It's before the parliament now being examined. And the UNC deliberately refused to attend as members of that committee. I don't see any headline on the Express and that is a scandal. Because the Express doesn't know what a scandal is. But every, every Sunday night, they're ready to talk foolishness. That's in the papers. Every Monday they have press conference to talk more foolishness. That's in the papers. But the fact that they are not turning up in a parliamentary committee to examine a $7 billion contract where the allegation is that they gave away $900 million to a contractor and we had to go and get it back. That doesn't make the headline in this country. And today as the babies die in Port of Spain in general, 
They refuse to, ad to send anybody on a joint select committee of parliament to look into healthcare delivery in Trinidad and Tobago. But they're, they're now crying crocodile tears over what happened in Port of Spain in general and hoping to use it politically. There's a, word in the, there's a word in the directory for that, you know, in the dictionary. It's called ghoul. It's spelled G-H-O-U-L. They are ghouls where crime is concerned and where the deaths of those children are concerned. What they see is political opportunity. What I see is pain and heartache. And what I want to know are the facts of the circumstances so we can rectify it. And if there are people to be held accountable, then they'll be held accountable after the facts are determined. There's no shortcut in that. And as I speak to you now, the central block that they didn't put up, they didn't build one block. The engineers in this country condemned that building, or main hospital building, condemned in 2009. They stayed in office from 2010 until 2015 and did absolutely nothing about the Port of Spain Hospital when the engineers condemn it. Thank God. We are well on the way to building a new hospital block in the Port of Spain General, in our capital city, to be ready in 2025. But they had $900 million to give OS by the simple removal of a clause in a contract. I don't know about you all, you know, but these people just make me feel to puke. And let me, finally, let me just say this. They will not prevent me from doing what I have been doing for the people of this country. We have a major undertaking now going on between Trinidad and Tobago and Ghana, because one of the things that we have to do you know, is, to, is to expand our economy, diversify our economy. We have re decided that one of the ways of doing that is to link up with another market where we have friends and possibilities, and we have been investing our time and our energies and our resources into growing our relationship and our market to Ghana. Last month, a major delegation left Trinidad and Tobago and went to Ghana, led by the Minister of Trade, leading a private sector delegation and some members of government. They had 156 meetings in Ghana with Ghanaian interests. We intend to continue this initiative. And it's against that, it's against that background that we are... I mean, a number of companies are alongside the government, and we are already seeing some progress. There's one company that is finalizing sourcing of raw materials for input into a company in that, that's operating in Baratari, another one that is um, getting its approvals for software access, Ghana, Benin, Togo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, because Ghana is a, a gateway into that sub-Saharan belly of Africa. And Trinidad and Tobago is a small country, but we are a manufacturing country. We are engaged in oil and gas. We engage in a range of manufacturing and other services. And we are ensuring that our relationship with Ghana works for our benefit. I'm told that Ansem Makal reported that it is on the verge of concluding distribution arrangements in Ghana. One of our major biscuit uh, making company doing the same thing. There is a company that's considering a battery factory in Ghana, from Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, you know, Ghana has access. Ghana opens access to hundreds of millions of people. If we can get a fraction of a percentage in that market, that is where growth can come to us, because our own self-sufficiency limits us to 1.4 million people. CARICOM limits, limits us to, again, another single number of millions. If we can do business in a larger market, then we be our future would hold a lot of promise. On the issue of connectivity, which is one of the impediments in the growth of this business, we have already signed an MOU with the government of Ghana, uh, an air services MOU with Ghana, that's already signed. And we have a standing negotiating committee on air services agreement on the way. And of course, we are waiting to conclude that with the Ministry of Transport in Ghana. With respect to investment, we are the execution of a bilateral investment treaty will create a predictable environment for investment between the companies in both countries, Ghana and in Trinidad and Tobago. 
and of course, we will pursue that. I have been invited by the Asantini, the king of the Ashanti, to be his guest of honor at his 25th anniversary, celebrating his ascend ascending the throne of the Ashantis. I have accepted the invitation. I will travel to Ghana on the 8th of May, and I will spread the word according to Trinidad and Tobago. And we will be represented, as we have been when we were at Ghana's 60th anniversary of independence. You may recall I was the feature speaker at that. I was a guest of honor at the 60th anniversary. These things might mean nothing to some people, but it would mean a lot to people who know what means something to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I've also accepted an invitation from one of the biggest businesses in India who are interested in invest, making an investment in sport in Trinidad and Tobago to operate a regional academy here. We've made some play already. Government has provided the land, and we are now at the stage of designing the physical structure. And um, I've accepted that, that, that invitation. So notwithstanding Mr. Mullal and his express friends and the scandal, that don't faze me at all. I'm on my way to Yashanti Palace, and I'm also going to go to Mumbai on the way from Africa. And those two, those two um, visits will have benefits for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I will not be distracted, and I will not be silent and misinformation making the news in Trinidad and Tobago. And the last thing I want to say is that the cabinet has approved that from here on in, come August 1st, the feature public holiday would be African Liberation, African Emancipation Day. The time has come for us to make it quite clear what emancipation means and who is being emancipated and from what. I have noticed at the international level that there are other people who are attempting to climb onto the emancipation bandwagon and attempting to add, add appendages to it. We in Trinidad and Tobago who led on this matter will have none of it, and we make it quite clear that emancipation in Trinidad and Tobago is as a result of the emancipation of slaves. And there's no comparison between slavery and any other form of human indignation. We, the descendants of slaves, we have a duty to preserve our history, our legacy, and make our claim without apologies to anyone. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. Sabaru, Guardian Media. Uh, before I ask my question, I just want to say something very respectfully. As a proud member of the Fourth Estate, um, you would have called us echo chambers you said part of the problem running with anything two things i remember in 2012 I, I am not i am not holding you personally responsible for anything and you there's no no this no defense is required by you because that doesn't change it changed nothing that i've said in 2012 we reported heavily on the former prime minister's travel thing i remember that secondly sir if it is that misinformation is a concern then respectfully i would advise that you tell some of your cabinet members that, to put systems in place to make it easier for us to get questions, to ask questions and get answers. Because, for example, I'm sorry he left the room, but you have a Minister of Finance here who takes pride in telling us that he's blocking our numbers. We have questions in some ministries that are sitting there. I don't know if they're making small ones, as people say, in Trinidad and Tobago. But there's something I'd just like to say before I ask the first question. So. In communication department, the place questions go to die. Was that? I see in our newsroom there's a geographical communications departments, the places that emails and questions go to die. So I mean all of that that just to put it into perspective. Yeah. We love the facts. Let me, let me just put it this way. Let me just put it this way. That, that that is your story. And you're sticking to it. I could tell you, as Prime Minister of this country, I have had more exposure to the media than all other Prime Ministers put together. And secondly, that much of what, much of the attempt to sensationalize is in the hope that information already in the public domain, in your files, 
is not reported and nor raised as a rebuttal to the attempt to sensationalize as you have done on this particular issue I just touched. So let's leave it there for the moment. Sure. And, and if, there, if there are people who don't want to talk to the media in my government, all I will say to them that you're in the wrong business. Being in politics and not wanting to talk to the media, you're in the wrong business. Stop, you said that, sir. With respect to the Pahu team, do you have any more information with respect to the no, composition, no, names, no, expertise? No, no, we don't. The Pahu has identified the three people. You remember, the minister had said Pahu wanted to know what was the information we have. And based on what we had and the issue, they will choose people who fit. And they have now done that. So in a few days or so, we probably get names. And they'll be here at the end of the month, before, you said? They before get, the end of the month. They aim to get here before the end, by, by the end of the month. And so. they, they will commence the investigation. And yes, and, and in the meantime, everything um, that is required for their successful visit would be made available. I could tell you, and I want to give the country the assurance that our hospitals are safe. We have had an issue in one ward. Unfortunately, the outcome has been quite disastrous. But our hospital system is not the collapse zone that some people would make it to be. Um, we, we can't overreact to the grief that their families will be going through. There are some people who are, you know, excitedly concerned about compensation. We're not there yet. We want to know what the facts are, and the facts will determine where we go from there. I just simply ask for a little bit of patience, and let us not confuse the issue. But well, we, we, we must get to the bottom of it. While we're waiting for um, this to begin, we got a release from the NWRHA that the lead of infection prevention control at the Port of Spain General has been sent on administratively pending the conclusion of the investigation. Those are management issues which I won't get into. And uh, the, the, I expect that the, the management that is responsible on location, the minister that has um, cabinet responsibility and the government that has overall responsibility that uh, will all identify our responsibilities and I said yesterday there are processes to be followed. What about calls in the public domain, not political but public domain from some for the Minister of Health to resign or lose his job? There is no minister more responsible than the Prime Minister. They are called my resignation all the time. No, not for you sir, <laughs> Mr. Terence Diaz. You have a question to resign to? They are asking reports to me. We are, if I should resign to according to that argument. Dr. Rowley, oh, there is Polo from CNC3. You mentioned the state of the healthcare sector as not being as bad and this incident with these babies, rising number um, of deaths in that NICU unit being an isolated one. But we've been hearing and seeing reports of horror stories from a wide cross-section of the population, mothers who were pregnant saying this is telling them they weren't ready yet and they had complications and that is a running story that we've been having and hearing. Do you think it's time to revamp the medical sector in Trinidad and Tobago as a result of these new concerns raised? I don't know that they're new. I mean, they always have, I mean, you always have stories like that about if the ambulance had come on time, the person would have lived. If, if um, a certain kind of outcome in treating health matters from time to time is not pleasant, but that is no comfort to those who are, in fact, experiencing that. What I just said is that let us not use this instance, which is quite disastrous, at one location to send the gong, the message that the health system has collapsed and that we should lose health confidence in the health system. There are thousands of people in the health system, as I speak to you this minute, who are providing appropriate health care. Right? So let us get to the bottom of this particular one, let us find out the facts, and let us treat with it. And I'm confident that out of it will come some improvement of one kind or another, because this is not a normal situation, and therefore that abnormality needs to be identified. I know there are some people who would want to use that as a, a jumping off point to raise everything else about the health service. But as I said yesterday in Sandy Grandi, we do have a significant positive that we can attach to our health healthcare delivery in this country. Yesterday, don't you think yeah. that the problem we have, and it, it is not only the health sector, but 
that in so many of the public sector institutions, you have this challenge that whenever there is a significant disruption, the, the first thing is to, of course, deal with the political figure. And while, of course, there's a level of accountability there, the, there is a difficulty in managing consequence for public officials who are able to be shielded and to, to seek shelter behind the political figure because so often that is the first person that we go to. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how do we, what do you think we can do to manage consequence in the public sector so that we don't have these recurring, because we have problems all the time. I mean, it's not just in the health sector. We have this situation in national security where well, they uh, have yeah. to make changes to the, to the SSA. And that it's is, the same problem all over again that we have. Well, what, you, what, you are, what you are touching on there is a general situation of the country's acceptance of protection. Um, we, we subscribe to the principle of how you're going to demand that. It is not one where the man got to be careful that that is not done to him. We have great difficulty in um, assigning uh, best practice management to our situations, especially the public service, because there is a whole lot of hoops that apply. And in some instances, there's stasis. I mean, we, we know what the disciplinary process is in the public service, and it is not one that engenders effective action. In fact, it is, it is, it, it, it is designed to, to bring about protection as against one that is designed to bring about extraction of, un, of wrongdoing or, or, or non-performance. You, you are better protected. I mean, but, you, but these, are, these are detailed matters which will complicate us at the moment in our search for facts. They are better dealt with after the facts are known and you can apply the facts in a way to say, well, okay, if, if these are the facts, then these kinds of actions are the relevant actions. But to be speculative now and try to raise that, it will give the impression that I know what I'm talking about with respect to this particular situation and that there's this to happen or that to happen without us getting to the facts. I would, I would want to preserve this conversation for another time. Yeah, just, okay, the, the link to that, you see, is there is a level of cynicism with respect to probes. Everything happens, we say we have a probe, we have an independent investigation and so on. And then nothing happens. So well, that the public isn't, isn't, the, the public isn't, pack, it, there's no, measure of assurance or co comfort when we hear the minister say, oh, we have it, we have in Taho, or we have in this one coming to do a probe. Because we all feel at the end of it that nothing is going to happen. The probes are, are not, they're not, they're not giving the public any confidence that things, we are going to find out what exactly happened and people are going to be. And I would say it. that until I see what the facts are, to engage that aspect of your conversation, I will wait. Because if we start going down that road now, in this situation, you see, that there's one option that is not available to the government in this period of cynicism or this uh, culture of cynicism that you mentioned, that nothing ain't gonna happen. The government could never say, well, okay, nothing ain't gonna happen, so we ain't gonna investigate it. We don't have that option. The option is something requires investigation, it must be investigated. Then the next thing is, how good is the investigation? And then the third thing now is, what do you do as an outcome of the investigation? And that is where the problems arise. You get investigations, and then you find that you are stymied here, or there's a lack of interest there. Or in fact, some, sometimes the investigation itself peters out. The infamous investigation into the the, 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 the stadium. We had, an, we had a commission of inquiry into the destruction of the stadium and the corruption of selling tickets there. And in the end, the investigation itself petered out into zero. 
We've had investigations where it was obvious that certain things should happen. I don't want to go into any specifics, you know, but I have a list of specific I can tell you, but there's one, there's one particular instance I could mention to you about where there was elementary corruption in a state entity. The government brought it to the attention of, a state, of, of, of our service commission. This officer is doing that, doing this, doing that. Elementary corruption. And the end result is the commission put the person back in the job. Uh, you, th you think that doesn't frustrate the government too? Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Kevin Ennis from 91.9. Um, there's news about the U.S. Um, resuming sanctions on Venezuela, um, where the oil and gas is concerned. And there are persons going around saying that we are going to be affected by it. Could you um, tell the nation or clarify to the nation how this will not affect us or will it affect us? We are not immune to what goes on between Venezuela and the and, 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 and United States. Because even as, as we say, that, that, that too is a moving target. What we have done is to try and build relationships and promote our interests in a wider sphere than in Port of Spain. So that whatever happens or whatever is happening or is to happen, with Washington and Caracas, we have resolutely kept our interests in front of all parties. And that's as much as I want to say now. Um, if the United States does things to Venezuela or about Venezuela, um, we can't guarantee that some of those things will not be um, detrimental to us, as in fact it has already been. But we have, we have some things in place which are not now directly affected by that. But that doesn't mean that it wouldn't be affected sometime in the future as the goalposts keep changing. Right? We, we, we have some... I mean, the, the whole idea of, of getting Venezuela to agree to export gas to Trinidad and Tobago, that is a positive. If it doesn't happen this year, and it happens 10 years from tomorrow, then that is a good thing. It's because you go from zero to wherever that is. We would love for it to happen sooner. The whole idea of us having out of that agreement a 30-year arrangement, that is positive. When it's going to start, there are some difficulties there. But it might be influenced by the outcome of the US elections because they're all intertwined. The politics of Florida, the politics of, of New York. In fact, one of, the, one of the few people on one particular side who were not supportive of what we were doing in Washington, one of our friends, as a matter of fact, friendly with us, but not supportive of this particular issue. He's out of, he's out of office now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so things happen. We, we don't know. Well, how, it, how it will work out or what could happen because this person was a chairman of a committee and was very important in the whole scheme of discussions and then out of the blue comes a court matter which has changed that and of course what we did in all the contacts that we've been making is to place value on the building of relationships and it is that approach that has worked for us we are not unknown in many quarters where decisions are made and where those decisions are important to our interests. So we've worked hard on that, and I think we're, better, we're in a better position now than we were 10 years ago or five years ago. Gregory McBurney from Trinidad Newsday, just returning to the issue with the babies at the NICU. Um, are you satisfied with the NWRHA's handling of the matter. I mean, it only came to light really after lawyers got involved and the media then reached out to the NWRHA to ask questions rather than something being said in advance. Well, I, I, I don't have enough information on that to be able to comment on that. But, um, you know, it, it's easy now in hindsight to say that, but I don't, I don't have that information. I just want to Prime Minister Julie Brown, T.D. Six News. You did say the Health Minister reports to you. Uh, you did say the health minister reports to you, so I'm wondering in those discussions of this recent issue, 
uh, have you uh, requested, for example, whether there be a review of the operations at that neonatal unit while the probe is ongoing to ensure that there are no further mm -hmm. issues of uh, deaths of babies at that unit? I, I, I didn't have to say that. The professional people in there, that was their first response. Once it was realized that there was a problem that was um, snowballing, that was their response, and that's, a, that's an ongoing arrangement. And what we've been doing here, we said, look, all that they're doing now will be examined in that overall investigation by PAO. So it's not that people have dropped their hands. It was, you know, it is, let us understand something, that we have professional people in the wards with serious responsibilities. And because something has happened doesn't mean that they have just thrown their hands up in the air. Understand? Uh, I, maybe I'm, I'm, I might be a little too understanding of the professional people in there, but I do know that there are professional people in there, both in the management and in the medical side of things. And the nurses, the doctors, let us not sell them short. Something has gone wrong. Things, as a matter of fact, yesterday somebody sent me a document from the United Kingdom, a hospital in the UK, that had a similar experience. And I think it was about 62 babies that, that they had lost in the UK. And of course, um, if you look around, you probably see other instances. It's a hazard of the trade. We were very proud um, of our um, infant mortality rate. This, this, this development here is at variance with what was happening in our system. And I say this so that we know that we know what is better. We, we were well below the level that was required to qualify as a progressive nation with respect to infant mortality. And here comes this incident. So we, we got to find out what has taken us off track. Good afternoon. Prime Minister, Harry is the news. Prime Minister, are you therefore satisfied with the state of public health care? If, if I was satisfied, I would have said so. I am not satisfied because what has happened is not what we have been accustomed to. So I can't be satisfied with that. And just to get back to, uh, to Ria's issue in terms of, of people you know, accounting for, for their actions. We have had a commission of inquiry into the death of four divers. They, they have found, I would recommend it, that Paria be, be um, charged uh, for corporate manslaughter. They have a, uh, write a lot of recommendations. Nothing is being done. Who, who's what, uh, the recommendation is that? The, the Commission of Inquiry recommendation. And who is the charge then? That, well, I mean... No, no, answer, answer, me, answer my question. You, you give me your question, I'm asking you. But who is to charge them? That, that is for the police, I guess, to do. And why are you asking but, me? No, but there, there have been um, other recommendations. The government cannot and, uh, the government has prior, to prior. I'm not allowing you to go on that misinformation road. The government of Trinidad and Tobago did what the government could do, which was in response to the public demand, we had a commission of inquiry. And we patiently facilitated that commission of inquiry. It was held in public. They asked for an extension of the time. They got it, and they went in great detail, and they produced a detailed document, which is now the summary of the facts. Charging of somebody is outside of the remit of the government. Only the police service, under the direction of the director of public prosecution, could charge anybody with anything in this country. And prior, you know that. So don't come to this press conference and ask me about charging people. I'm saying, Prime Minister, that there are recommendations that the government can implement. And you know, there is a sense that nothing has happened after the commission inquiry. That is not so, true. So I'm asking the context now. After the, um, this investigation by PAHO, what, what would give the public well, confidence don't, don't that jump something up, don't, would be done? Don't conflate the two things. Don't con you just made a statement there which you don't know what you're talking about, that nothing has happened. I know for a fact that when the people came to visit me here, I was able to tell them. I didn't see it said to you then. I was able to tell them, and I know for a fact, that the insurance, the lawyers for Paria have been meeting or, or talking to or communicating with people on the other side. 
And one of the things I said to the group that came to see me here was that the insurance for Paria, I told them that Paria has insurance to cover Paria's liability, whatever that might be, and that the insurance is being processed. And one of the things that they needed to do is to encourage their people to cooperate with that and provide. There was one more step to be done. LMCS had to provide some work records for their people to the insurance so that this matter of insurance and, and processing could be concluded swiftly. That is what I said to them. I didn't see that being said to you. I saw argument about who should be fired and who should be charged. So when you say nothing has happened, that is not true. In fact, Paria is under instructions from the, 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 the minister eh, to move as quickly as possible and as empathetically as possible, that's the word that was used to Paria, to get this matter concluded within the context of any liability that applies to Paria. So that is what is happening. But what is not happening is that the Prime Minister or the Minister is not out front waving any flag in a situation where there are lawyers lined up, right? And people are taking it as a matter that we're going to fight in the court. That being so, we have to very carefully preserve the interests of the taxpayer by not talking out of turn and not making statements that could be used against the taxpayer. Um, so given what has happened there in Paria, then uh, I'm asking, could you instill some kind of confidence in terms of the PAHO report now that, that people would be satisfied in terms of what is going to take place? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me to do. What I, could, what I just told you, PAHO has selected three experts who will come and meet the people here. They have no cocoa in the sun here. That is as independent as you can get. Of course, I mean, I, I, you would see some people say, well, anything at all would be not, not independent. But PAHO, the government has invited PAHO to find the persons to come here and examine the performance of our department, of our officers, of our protocols, of our processes, and tell us, as professionals in the business, where we fell down and how we rectify it. That is what a government can do at this point in time. If that meets cynicism, I don't know that I have any antidote for that. But I am confident that PAHO will do a professional job and will give us some answers to the questions that are now in front of us. And if at the end of that, there are liabilities, there are complaints against individuals or entities or protocols, we will then have to deal with that. But we can't deal with it now because we don't know what we're dealing with. Okay? And it, I'm, I'm not here, just, I'm not being on. I, I would love this evening to get a report saying this is what happened. But it doesn't go like that. And anybody who's stirring it up to go like that, just not helpful. It might be useful to them, but to us and to the people involved, because I'm sure the professionals in the hospital also want to know right, that their professionalism is examined and hopefully will be found not to have been the cause, but we don't know what the cause is yet. Prime Minister, Minister, just for clarification, I'm just wondering, so, uh, how does it work in a situation like this? Does the government give PAHO a deadline for its or does no, PAHO... No, no, no. We, or <laughs> PAHO is a, a regional entity, a, a subunit of WHO. They, we, we, are, we, are, and we, we are a nation covered by their terms of reference. The terms of reference of their existence is to be able to come in and do a professional job. Right? We have to rely on their professionalism. PAHO is not part of any political party. They're not looking for a job. They're not looking for payment for this or payment for that. They, that is how countries protect themselves. Right? So we have now invited them in to come and look at what has happened to us. They've done it in other countries, and they will do it in other countries in the future. So let us just rely on the fact that we have maintained our position in PAHO, and now we, we require their service, and they will come and serve us to the highest level that they are able to. 
Prime Minister. Yes, yes, lady. All right. Um, <laughs> the Reese Polo. Mm -hmm. So we have at least 11 families mourning the loss of, as you said, our newest citizens. But the entire nation was rocked by the beheading of a four-year-old child while at the time you were out of the country on vacation. What is your re initial reaction to that? And what message would you have for this public and this population that is reeling from a crime situation that seems to be getting worse? There isn't much I can say to that without, I, as far as I'm aware, someone has been charged, which is the next step if a crime has been committed and the, and, and the facts have been found. The person is being subjected to psychiatric examination. These, these are the processes. I don't know any comment from me will um, change any of that. I could simply empathize um, with, with any person, whether it's friend, family, community, who would have, have... I mean, I was in Ireland when I saw that, and it shook me quite there. It shook me. I, was, I, I woke up one morning and saw that, and I know of one instance of that in my lifetime. Happened... And I, it didn't happen when I was... How it, how it went. I got to know about it when I was a child, about an incident that took place like that. And just, just, being, just hearing about the story was, was, was painful. And to see it enacted here, I, I just could imagine the horror of having to experience that. And even though I wasn't here in Trinidad and Tobago, that was a bad day for me. So I, 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 can't, I can't add anything to it in terms of what action is to be taken, because so far, the available actions have been taken. And we just have to empathize and provide support as far as we're able to, to the family that's going through that. And not just the family, the friends, the, the entire community and nation is rocked by that. You know, we, we, so, you know we, we behave as though we're big and bad and independent. But you know, it's when things like that happen, we know how much we're connected to one another. You know, if, if you ever look at a situation when a child gets killed in a school, and you look at the level of mourning that takes place between those children who are survivors, then you'd realize how much we take for granted. And when things like that happen, you ask yourself, I mean, you know, did, did I miss something? Could I somewhere, someday, sometime would have said to somebody that I love you, and now they're gone like this, and you, you see how these children mourn when something happens like that? That shakes me up. So these things are not individual. These are, these are national disasters. And I don't know, we we going after guns for, to prevent them from shooting people. We kill somebody with a cutlass, with a knife, choke somebody to death, give them poison. It is a whole idea of our inhumanity that is being examined here. Right? And unfortunately, violence seemed to have become an ever-present part of our existence. Violence. Every little thing, the response is violence. That's what we need to get to the root of. Do you have any response to the opposition leader's description of the, UA, uh, of the EDC as corrupt? Because um, polling divisions were moved from San Fernando East to San Fernando West, and not from Orbuch East to San Fernando West. And the, the name of Point of Pier, the Point of Pier constituency, was changed to Claxton Bay to have a psychological impact on people so that they don't associate point of fear with the closure of Petro Trin and the pain that that brought and so on. Do you think it was a The only comment I have to make on that is that Trinidad and Tobago has an irresponsible opposition leader. Irresponsible to the point of uselessness. Because one would think that a person holding the position of opposition leader would contribute to the national narrative and assist in the national digestion of issues. The opposition leader is a senior counsel, albeit self-appointed, but she's a lawyer. And it is deliberate misrepresentation for political benefit why the opposition leader takes those positions. 
I have been an MPA for many decades in what is called a PNM stronghold, the Diego Martin area. We had three Diego Martin constituencies. As a matter of fact, there used to be one St. George, it used to be, it used to be St. George West, one seat. Then it became two, Diego Martin East and Diego Martin West. Then they became Diego Martin Central. And as Diego Martin West MP, on at least one occasion, the boundary that I represented would have changed. I think it's what twice as, as a matter of fact, the boundary, but boundary changes. And you know what one expects from a lawyer, even a, 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 a fireside or, 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 or a lawyer who just, once you have the title, you know what you expect from a lawyer? That you be educational in your discourse. Everybody who deserves to be a commentator on this matter about boundary change should therefore put their hand up and say, yes, I know that polling division 005 is Shaka Shakari Island. That is the system that you operate. 005 is Shaka Shakari Island. The law, the law is a little piece of arithmetic that you divide the total number of electors by the number of seats and you get a figure. And then no seat should have more people that is than 10% of that average or 10% below. So depending on how the population grows or moves, it's like a waterbed, over time you will have to change the boundaries for that law, that formula to apply. And that's why Diego Martin West, you start down there, is the first constituency that will get its quota, 005. By the time you get to 041 in West Moorings, you've got enough people to fill one seat. And then you come to the next one, and the next one, and you, next, and you keep going east, and you keep going central and south. If, if San Fernando West, which is an urban area, right? On the geography, you see a very small area, but it has a large number of people inside it. If San Fernando West has fallen below, you can't get people from the sea. You've got to get them from either east, west, east, north, or south. And of course, people into San Fernando seats, San Fernando East, San Fernando West, either come from Oropooch sometimes, or from La Parima, or from Pointe Pear, and so on. We have put in place an election and boundaries commission. Some countries don't have that. They fight it out. Look at Haiti. What's going on? Look at what's going on in Haiti right now. But we have an election and boundaries commission that is highly respected in the international community. You know how many times people from our commission are invited to go to other countries to assist and to help them run the elections? You know why? It's because our election and boundaries commission over the decades that they have existed, have demonstrated that ability to conduct elections using best practice. And for the opposition leader, of all people, to be talking about corruption because a boundary is changed here, or a boundary is changed there, or a name is changed here, or a name is changed here, and to de describe that as corruption on the part of the commission is unfair, it is unreasonable, and it says more about the opposition leader than it says about the Election and Boundaries Commission. And that is all for the benefit of people who, as I said earlier on, there is a, there's a requirement to insist that people are not fed lies, otherwise they could damage themselves by believing that. The opposition leader is pandering to people who she believes are ignorant. They don't know, and so therefore whatever she tells them they will believe. Right? And casting aspersions on people is her hallmark. That's what she does. And I think this is very unfair. And she's not damaging the, 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 the people in the EBC, you know. She's damaging the country. Because to be telling the world that our EBC is somehow engaged in gerrymandering seats for the, for the PNM is not true. It is a lie. I could tell you. We in the PNM met with the EBC in our normal once in a while conversations in 20, 20 in early 2020, I think it was, or the 2019. And we made very few recommendations to the EBC. One of those recommendations we made, in fact, two of them, we said that there are, there are some seats that the name of the constituency does not. 
properly reflect changes that have gone on. So when you hear the name of the constituency, you don't immediately know who they represent geographically. One of those constituencies is Mayaro. It used to be Ottawa Mayaro, which ran from the Ottawa River all the way down to Maruga. Over time, with the growth of population in the Princess Town area, a seat was created called the Princess Town South. That was the first attempt by the EBC to deal with that population growth there. Princess Town South, which went from south of Princess Town down to the coast in Maruga. So Mayaro lost that piece of Maruga that was there. Then when Komoto Manzanilla was created and Nariva was um, eliminated and Komoto Manzanilla took some of the north from Mayaro, the bulk of the people you know, that were added to bring the numbers up to the required formula demands came from Iroclaro. So we said to the EBC, if you really want to let the name represent who are in the seat, this, that constituency now should really be Mayaro Rio Claro. So that the Rio Claro people could now know that, that they are in with Mayaro and, in, and numerically it's a, it's a big chunk of Rio Claro that is now in Mayaro. Mm -hmm. The EBC said to us then that, oh, it was too late for the recommendation and they wouldn't do it. We made the recommendation again after Soon after the 2020 election, and we expected that that would have been done in the, whenever the next report comes in. I didn't see it being done there. Right? We also said that there's another, there's a, um, the, the Separa constituency, right? Who, one of the big communities in this country is Pinal. Which seat Pinal is in? Who knows where Pinal falls when you look at a constituency? And then I don't know that we made any recommendation of any of the five seats that the EBC interfered with in the East-West Corridor. I don't know because I have, not, I have not spoken to the EBC for years. And the chairman, as chairman, did you ever speak to him? No. We did. You did? We never made, it was, it was news to me when I saw the report that they did make these adjustments, that they changed names and they changed boundaries. I don't expect the PNM to make any statement like what the opposition leader has made, because we give the EBC certain parameters, and when you go to the parliament, if we have any recommendations, we'll make them there, right? Because we know how, we know have a report. That report came to me at the end of March. I would have had the report in my hand. The law required it to be there. I think it was the 23rd of March, something like towards the end of March. That, that was the, the law. The report came in a few days or a day or two before the legal limit. And I was leaving the country then. The next thing I know, within hours, the opposition leader was talking about going to court to demand that the report be laid in the parliament. The laying of the report in the parliament is there in law as a requirement for the cabinet to put it in the parliament. A few days you now, she was going to the court. The report went to the parliament within, it went, it, it went within about oh, two weeks, three weeks? Less than three weeks. And the report was laid in parliament. There was no intention on the part of anybody in the government to delay it. And guess what? I saw the opposition leader saying, taking credit, literally saying so, you know, I am taking credit because I threatened to go to court and therefore the report was laid in parliament. That's the behavior of the opposition leader. Absolutely useless because nobody had to go to court for the report to be laid in the parliament. When we laid in the parliament, and now you get these stories about boundary change and or a pooch and whatever, whatever. We are not participating in that. If we have a recommendation to make to the EBC, we make them when you get to the parliament. And we believe that the EBC is an entity that is carrying out its duty as required by the Constitution, which is to independently adjust these matters. We have no basis at this time to say that the EBC has not done that. Just in the of the election, um, there seems to be um, dissension in the ranks with the opposition questions about uh, suitability as political leader of the UNC. That is not part of my conversation. Oh, ah, but I'm, I'm get, that, I'm getting that is question. not a part. I, that is not a part of my press conference. I'm getting to the question. The, the question is, do you see it as an opportunity for your government and your party to strike with a snap election? I just told you that your direction is not a part of this press conference. Prime Minister, I'm just wondering, just again, for under, better understanding. Andrea Perez-Sovers from the Trinidad Guardian. 
uh, bearing off of, of, of the topic a bit, do you agree that the leadership of the CDB is an internal matter to the institution that the regional heads of government should not be involved? Could you repeat that question to me, please? I don't want to make sure I get the question. I'll tell you what I'm saying. <laughs> Do you agree that the leadership of the CDB is an internal matter to the institution that the regional heads of government should not be involved? No, I don't agree with that at all. The CDB as a regional institution falls to be looked at by the regional leaders. As a matter of fact, when I was in Guyana at the last heads of government meeting, a significant part of our discussion had to do with the carrying on at the CDB. And if there's anybody who is indicating that the regional heads have no business in being concerned or being uh, moved by what's happening with the CDB, then they're very wrong. And second question, I'd just like to know when would the mid-year uh, budget review be called? Um, the Minister of Finance has not indicated that to me yet, but I think it's about the end of April. That usually comes in the end of April, early May, so it looks like it's going to be sometime in early May. Okay. Yes, Drew. I was just wondering, just uh, for a little bit of better understanding, the ABC would make, a, would make recommendations in this report. Is it that all the recommendations have to be agreed to by the government? The government can make changes? How does that work? The work of the ABC goes to the Parliament. And it's a recommendation to the parliament. Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to see it like that. It's a recommendation. If what you're asking me is that any changes could be made, the answer is yes. I don't think we've made any changes. In my time, I don't know that we've made any changes to any of those reports. But it doesn't mean that if a change has to be made, that we, don't, we can't make it. Um, because I must say, I mean, as we're talking about this, let's... let's carry the conversation. I myself was very surprised when I saw the Claxton Bay seat because I couldn't figure it out and I still can't figure it out because Point of Pierre is a community that is a well-known community that had a whole constituency named Point of Pierre. The PNM won Point of Pierre many, many times. And what I saw in this report is a, 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 I know that the Point of Pierre seat goes up towards Claxton Bay. So I wasn't surprised when I saw a polling division added to point the pair. And what I would have thought then, and I'm not thinking aloud here, is that the new seat would be point the pair Claxton Bay. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I hear that that was a mistake that they didn't mention point the pair. But to, to, to jump from being point the pair to being Claxton Bay, that one kind of got me a little. You know, I, I think I don't fully understand that. And uh, there's going to be a debate of the report, and these are the matters that we'll discuss. And as I say, the EBC document to the Parliament is simply a recommendation from uh, an uninterested party, as we call it, an independent commission. Thanks for the clarification, Prime Minister Morning. How soon will, be, uh, will that report be debated in Parliament? Um, as soon as the leader of government business finds a slot for it, we have a lot of other things on the agenda, but is, um, we'll do it real, you know, sometime. Hopefully before the term is, um, before the, the recess. It's going to be sometime not, not too distant future. Um, uh, uh, that Prime Minister said a lot of TDP news, there's been reportedly been some interest in the point of a refinery. Any comment on that? I would say yes, there's some interest that we are a little bit excited about, and I hope that um, we've had so many um, bridesmaids without a wedding that um, we're hoping that this, we do have, we've had, we, we keep getting interest along the way, but many times they turn out not to be, they don't pan out. But um, we have had some interest in recent times, and if we are a little reluctant to speak about it, at this stage we'll simply say that um, as soon as there's some ink on some paper, we will let the population know. But we do, we, we, we think we have a, an interest now which might um, stay the course. Is that right, Mr. As a result of your travels, you know, some interest? A little bit. <laughs> Prime Minister, <laughs> Prime Minister, you would have um, mentioned a while ago um, about the involvement of the Defence Force 
in the crime we've got um kind of alleviate any crime situation in parts of Trinidad and Tobago where you would have said that you would have put at least a hundred thousand hundred million. million. Yeah. Well um yeah. Yeah. that is going a piece. We we have put a structure, we've set we we've we've, we've fleshed it out. It's it um it's it's we have something to work with now. And it's on its way to the cabinet for final authorization to effect it. And we I must tell you, we in working it through, there's a large cabinet subcommittee that is working it through. And we also have got significant interest for volunteerism to play a role in that improvement. And I'm I'm very keen for it to be to roll out and to get the volunteers who have offered themselves to work with the government and the, the communities to benefit ourselves. Dr. Ali, are you concerned at all about the report on the secondary roads company, it being audited, and the CEO and minister, line minister supposedly being at odds? Yes, I am, I am interested in it, and um, that is a matter that is going to attract the attention of the cabinet very soon. Dr. Ali, a um, question regarding the SSA. Is there any update on the investigation or the operations of the SSA and how many people can you say, apart from Major Best, have either been sent on leave or terminated? I do not have that information at this moment, but I have a meeting tomorrow. Where is it? Thursday, is it? Monday. I have a briefing meeting on Monday, and subsequent to Monday, I would be able to give you a better, answer, a better answer. Prime Minister, you um, in character, you're in charge of cricket, right? Um, mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> well, you've been not in charge of cricket. You've been placed on a committee I that chair, will be. I with chair the chair. Caricom right. Cricket Subcommittee, not to be in charge of cricket, but to see whether we could cooperate with Cricket West Indies to improve our I cricket. I think that, but I was talking about Sunil Narayan. Um, he has been doing very well. I mean the IPL, and there have been calls now for him to come to retirement and play um, for the West Indies in the World Cup. What are your thoughts on that? I didn't, I didn't hear that, but I, 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 I was hoping that you were going to, um, and I was going to thank you for mentioning it, that we do have here in Trinidad and Tobago um, next week, Thursday and Friday, the, there's this conference on Cricket West Indies. <laughs> It's a CARICOM event. I'm chairing the subcommittee, so I'm chairing it in Toronto and Tobago. A number of persons are coming in. I think we have about 75 people coming in, various from various aspects of cricket. Some of the legends come in, Clive Lloyd, mm -hmm. hopefully the Richards, um, a number of people who are directly involved, Cricket West Indies. The president is here on Sunday. And we're hoping that on Thursday and Friday we'll have a, a full blowout on West Indies cricket. And Hopefully, to come from that is some way forward. I haven't heard, um, I see Sunil no more of a, of a batsman than a bowler, because the last time I saw him, he was being carted all over India, and then I see he made a century. So, I mean, he can handle himself as required. Um, what we're hoping to do, eh, and I, 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 I'm hoping that this conference could guide, show us a way forward to make sure that the best players play for the West Indies at all levels in all the various genres of the game. What is happening is that we don't have a management structure or a support structure that allows that to happen. Cricket nowadays is now a, a, a multi-billion dollar business. And going through from school to play for West Indies is no longer the single pathway. There are the whole plethora of pathways, some of which take our best players away from the field of play when we need them. So we have to come up with some kind of arrangement where we get our best players at all times to play for the West Indies. And not only Sunil, but whoever else. Uh, but I would like to sort of play in the World Cup. I'm hoping that our, our World Cup team is our strongest team. I don't know that, um, you know, if we go into T20, I don't know that there are very many other people who are available who are better than he is, but um, I leave that to the selectors. We, we usually criticize the selectors after they made the selection. But, but he, uh, I mean, retired from the National last year, so um, well, he might need to convince Retirement him. normally is very personal. Eh? Retirement is very personal, and if a person is retired, to try to get them to come out of, of retirement is, a, is an assignment that usually... Would you, would you try? 
like me. Yeah. I'm not in a position to influence anything on that. I mean, I, I, I will go as far as to say I would like to see the best team on the field. And if Senegal is in that team, I would not have any argument with that. But I don't know um, that he would, you know, come out of retirement. If he if he comes out of retirement as a commitment to Western cricket, that'd be great. But um, we we just we have to, we have a lot of frayed ends in Western cricket, and we need to get on with the program because we, we're the smallest country playing cricket now in the world. I don't know if you all know that. In international competitive cricket, West Indies is the smallest. We all, we've always been, but now when cricket is awash 24 hours a day all around, it's a very complicated matter now. And, 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 and the, the finance that goes with the existence of cricket, international cricket, now we, we are not in the ballpark. So there are a lot of things we have to look at, not just inviting a good player from, from retirement. And I'm hoping that the conference this weekend um, next weekend brings us to focus on some of these things. And hmm? We'll be attending that conference. A, lot of, a few CARICOM heads. Um, Prime Minister Barbados is coming. Um, um, the former Prime Minister of Grenada is coming. Some West Indies captains, some West Indies players' representatives, some, play, some, some business persons, CPL people, and a general mix of, 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 of conversation. And um, it's, we're hoping that um, it will stimulate some interest in supporting Western cricket in a way that it has not been uh, supported and clarified. And of course, the whole question of who owns Western Indies cricket will certainly surface again and how it is managed. So all of these things will come up. So members of the media, if you are, you're welcome to come and join us because there's provision there for the media to observe and to make your comments if you are there. Because we have, we have plenary sessions. Dr. Rowley, we are at a post-cabinet media conference. Did any decision take place that you are prepared to share with the population? About the Today? No, some, ca <coughs> some cabinet meetings are quite mundane. Today we had about 60 notes and I, think, I don't think any of them warranted a press conference on their own. A lot of it had to do with reports that have to go to Parliament. So we didn't have anything exciting to tell you about out from, the, from today's notes. You know, so, so it's one of those days. The HDC fired a contractor that was involved in the trash trail project. Any comments on, on, on that and the use of taxpayers' money in, in a scenario such as that one? Well, if you're building a house and the contractor doesn't satisfy you in the end and you can't see eye to eye, that's, these are par for the course. Unfortunately, I don't, um, I don't think any contractor likes to be fired or should allow themselves to be fired because of... Um, but usually these things have two sides and the contractor is fired, but if, if you talk to the contractor, he might say something else. I have not seen the document yet about the, the firing, as you said, but I knew that there was some great dis disagreement between the contractor and the HCC. I, do, I don't know the legal details, so I wouldn't want to pretend to have that information. With respect to cabinets, uh, um, you would have made statements, I'm taking this question from my sports desk, that they saw turning at the um, Palo Seco Velodrome so late last year, that um, you were prepared to take a note to cabinet for funding to support club cricket. Where are we with that, sir? Well, out of the discussion in the coming week here, um, I, I, I'm sure that um, when you look at the solutions, one of the things that will come up is the fact that um, the heyday of club cricket, which gave us some of the great players, seemed to have passed. And since that had worked for us before, it may be that that's one of the areas that we should invest in, um, in supporting clubs to get more people playing cricket and, get, and playing it um, with a view to being the nursery for West Indies cricket. Might come up on the weekend, so I'm waiting to see that. Dr. Rowley, sir, you mentioned earlier about the, the Indian company investing in sports in Trinidad. You care to shed a bit more light on it? What's the name of the company, the value of the investment? What sport in particular? Um, it's cricket. Um, it, um, we talk, we, the cabinet was approached by um, interest from Trinidad and Tobago and India for, to create in Trinidad and Tobago uh, a world-scale um, academy for cricket. We agreed to the proposal. 
and um, it was going to be a, a joint effort between Trinidad and Tobago, the government, and the, what you call a public-private partnership, you can call it that. But what they needed from the government was land. The government has made the land available, and we are now waiting for the investment to progress. Um, it's that parcel of land opposite the um, opposite Twin City Mall, where where Panchen Bego's stall headquarters is. Um, we did have discussions with Panchen Bego. Panchen Bego agreed to give up uh, to trade the parcel for accommodation in the city of Port of Spain. We are working on that right now. We did try to um, Panchen Bego had identified the old post office as a place that they could have had as the headquarters. But upon examination, that building is now condemned. Um, and we are working, Udicott is working with Panch and Bego and others to see how we could um, work on that. So that work is going on that area. But in the meantime, the parcel of land has been identified for a high quality, high grade academy. And that, the, the, the supporting of this academy is one of the foundations of the restoration of West Indies cricket as far as we are concerned. Because if more academies exist in the region to encourage more players to take part in the sport and to be developed to the level required, then it can only be to the benefit of West Indies cricket and the nation as a whole. Any company from India? Can you give us a name? The name of the company is Reliance. It's one of the biggest companies in India, the Ambani family. My invitations have come to me from the Ambani, so they, and they're the ones who, um, they're very familiar with Trinidad and Tobago through our players. Um, Captain Pollard is there, and um, I am going to spend a couple of days with them in Mumbai on the way back and advance this problem. This, this, I hope to see them. Um, they sent an, an architect down to see the site, and he's, he's designing the facility. So we hope to move towards an investment stage in the not too distant future. But it's something that we want to encourage, because as you, you know the role that India plays in cricket. And of course, an investment from India and Trinidad and Tobago in cricket, um, the cabinet felt could only be welcome. So we're encouraging that. You would have talked about your interest or your um, wanting to um, get closer to Ghana, where Trinidad and Tobago and Ghana is concerned. I'm just wondering, are you willing to open up for banks from Africa to come and be a part of Trinidad and Tobago or the CARICOM? Well, anybody wanting to open a bank in Trinidad and Tobago, um, the door is open there, but there are requirements that you have to go through. And if, if there is a bank from Ghana that wants to invest in Trinidad and Tobago, I don't know at this time of any impediment that stands in the way. We have um, our main, our biggest bank in Trinidad and Tobago has in, um, stepped into Ghana, bought a bank there, and is growing itself. And we hope that it grows by leaps and bounds. So what we, what I did say when I read from that paragraph for you, is that we're seeking to have investment interests from Ghana in Trinidad and Tobago and from Trinidad and Tobago in Ghana. And if those interests grow, it's not just about Ghana. It's entering Africa as an African market. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming, and let's hope that we get over some of the difficulties that we've been talking about. Thank you. This is TTT. Live for local.